So again, the idea behind re the reorganization is straightforward. What we want to do is walk our way through the balance sheet one item at a time and ask ourselves that question. Does the firm need this to operate? Now, sometimes there's some ambiguity and sometimes we have to make some choices as analysts. And what we want to do at that point is every time we make a choice, every time we make an assumption and say, we're assuming this is operating in nature because we can't find anything that says that it's not, uh, we would just make a note of that in our DCF, right? You can make a note in an Excel spreadsheet, a little tag that, so if I hover over the cell, I can see the note. Uh, and then we can report all of these choices that we made. Because this is a long process, you're gonna forget that you made all these choices. And you wanna be able to, when you demonstrate this to someone, you wanna be able to show them all the where all the bodies are buried, so to speak. Well, okay, we made all these different choices. Here, I assumed all of the cash that the firm holds is uh, operating cash and they don't have any excess cash. Here's the reasons why I think that's true. Uh, they wanted uh, you know, X, Y, and Z. And uh, so here's why I think all of the cash that they're holding is operating, right? as opposed to making some different choice uh, where I might put a different note in there. Right? So the process is straightforward. The implementation is not. Right? It can be as complex as the balance sheet because there are gonna be lots of balance sheets that are really complicated they're gonna have lots of different types of assets and liabilities. And we as analysts are gonna to have to make the determination what's operating and what's not operating. Okay, so even though the, the directive is simple, the implementation is not going to be simple. Good. So you'll be doing this on your homework. So I want you to get a feel for both this and some other different types. Um, but um, in terms of what we're doing here, we are just identifying all the operating assets. So we're looking for the current operating assets. Then we're looking with for the long-term operating assets. And uh, we're gonna talk about some, some caveats to this. What Some of the things that, there are even going to be uh, pseudo assets that aren't listed as assets on the balance sheet that we are going to try to identify and include as assets, okay? These are things like capitalized leases, which we talked about in the last chapter. A capitalized lease is, um, a lease that the firm has taken out, maybe they're leasing a truck or a plane or something like that. And what we're gonna try and do is say that if the firm is using this asset as if it owned it, even though it's only renting it, we are going to try to adjust the balance sheet to say, to uh, put in these pseudo assets. So uh, I'll show you an example later, but you know, we will take a rental plane, we will add it as an asset on the balance sheet, we will uh, we will include it as an operating asset. And we'll do the same thing with uh, research and development. If it is a significant part of the business, we want to include research and development as an asset. Now it'll be an intangible asset because R&D is not something you can hold usually. It's intellectual property and, 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 and studies and things like that. But for instance, if you're a pharmaceutical company and 50% of your normal operating expenses go to R&D to paying for research and development, then that's a huge part of your business that's an incredibly integral part of your operations and we want to include that as an intangible asset uh, and we want to include the expense of that in our recalculation in our no clap okay so there is going to be uh some uh some i don't want to say trickery but but sort of trickery where, where we have to we have what we are trying to do is identify if there are anything any things that the company is uh using like an asset that they aren't identifying as an asset. And if we can do that and we can be confident in it, we want to, when we reorganize the balance sheet to calculate domestic capital, we want to plug those things in uh, and treat them as assets, even if the company is not treating them as an asset, right? We will subtract all operating liabilities. So this is one of the, like the key things that's going to help you distinguish the liability side is if it pays interest, it is not a operating liability. It is a financing liability. And the interest part is the specific indicator to us that it's financing and, and not operating. So operating liabilities is only gonna be non-interest bearing liabilities. Uh, so most common of these are gonna be the current liabilities related to suppliers like accounts payable, employees like accrued salaries and um, uh, accrued wages withholding, um, that's sometimes called that, customers, any kind of deferred revenue or customer advances, and the government, any kind of income tax payable. Okay, so uh, 
Uh, if it pays interest, we are going to conclude it. Uh, we're going to include it as debt and, and talk about it later. So that gives us invested capital, operating assets minus operating liabilities. To calculate total funds invested, we add any non-operating assets. So this is going to be things like excess cash, any kind of security holdings that the firm has, uh, any kind of receivables that aren't like accounts receivable, um, all kinds of different things, prepaid pension assets, uh, non-consolidated subsidiaries. So this is a a company that uh, a, a subsidiary that the company owns, but they don't consolidate their information into the balance sheet, right? So we won't consider that as part of their operations because they are keeping that business separate from the main business. Um, and then there's all kinds of other non-operating assets. There's too many to list or even mention. Uh, what we're trying to do here, again, this is part of the analyst's job is identifying clearly what the firm does so that we can identify what's operating and what's not okay now sometimes that's tricky if we're looking at Domino's, it's very clear what Domino's does they are a business that sells pizza so anything that is involved in the pizza business that's operating anything that they own or do that isn't part of the pizza business that's not operating right so it's going to be really clear uh like i saw an article in the wall street journal just today about uh taco bell is selling wine they've got something called like uh, jalapeno merlot or something like that so they have a, a wine brand right but we know what taco bell does taco bell sells operates the uh, uh, fast food taco joints uh throughout the u.s well throughout the world actually but uh, they're mostly popular in the u.s right they're not a winemaker wine producer wine seller they have made this sort of weird branch jump into selling wine if i was looking at their business i would consider that to be not operating unless for some reason it took off and became uh, a huge part of their business, right? It's unlikely. Now, on the other hand, if we're looking at GE, well, GE does a little bit of everything. So it would be very difficult for us to identify assets that are non-operating, uh, specifically with a company like GE, because if we're looking at the full list of their assets, we can't really tell what, you know, unless we're an expert, we can't really tell what assets are required to build uh, submarines versus what assets are required to make MRI machines or light bulbs or you know, you're going to need all kinds of different weird assets and buildings and machinery and all that kind of stuff. We, we, it could be harder for a company like GE than for a company that has a very specific uh, operating uh, business, operating nature. Okay. So we add non-operating assets. We're going to do that at the end of our DCF, uh, and that gives us total funds invested. Right. Now, you may be asking, why do we even bother with all this, right? Like, what's the point? It, that's, it's a lot of work. There's assumptions involved. We might make mistakes. Why even should we separate non-operating items? Why shouldn't we just treat uh, the firm's invested capital uh, as all of their assets, operating or non-operating, minus their liabilities, right? So that, that we, we have a good idea of, of what the firm's investments are. And the answer is because Typically, we should expect that the firm's non-operating assets have a lower return than the firm's operating assets. And that's it's sort of by, by definition, right? If, if the firm is making more money by, say, investing in other uh, shares and buying equity in, in different companies than it is in its core operating business, then the firm should stop whatever its core operating business is and just become a hedge fund and start trading equity in other firms. Right? And if we have, say, excess cash that we're keeping in a savings account, then certainly we hope that the business is making more than all that money sitting in a savings account. Now, that might not be a big deal for the firm that we just looked at, where you know even if they did have some excess cash, it was only a couple million. It's a huge deal for some of these big tech firms that have billions and billions in cash holdings, uh, where that's a significant piece of their assets. Maybe 10, 15% of their total assets is cash that to be considered cash has to be kept in a savings account or marketable security. So a very low risk, very low return asset. Might only be making say 3%. Well, we don't want to then use that, consider that an asset and conflate that with the firm's operating assets because that's gonna reduce the firm's return, right? The larger our invested capital, the smaller, in general, our ROIC is going to be. And particularly if some of that invested capital is earning a significantly lower return than the firm's other assets. Okay. 
So the reason we try to separate that is so we get a, just a picture of the firm's operating assets and the return generated by those operating assets. Again, the firm should only be in the business that it is in if it is doing it better than anything else it could do. And it's doing it better than any, anyone else could do. And so we expect to see an example like this where the firm's core operations have a return of about 4, 14%. Whereas the excess cash is maybe earning 3% in a savings account or a bond, and the equity investments are earning the average for equity investments of about 8% a year. Right? So we want to try and remove excess cash and equity investments because they're going to distort our overall picture of the ROIC of the operations of the firm uh, if we include them in invested capital. And likewise, if we could break it down, we'd like to even break it down further, right? You could imagine the case just like this example where the firm's core operations were consisted of two separate units. For GE, you might think about, say, the wind turbine unit and the light bulb unit. And we would expect that the light bulb unit actually probably has pretty low returns overall because how much profit is there in light bulbs? That's not a high risk, high return kind of business. But wind turbines or Nuclear submarine engines or MRI machines, probably a pretty high margin, high risk, high return business. So that could be our unit B. But the core operations, what we report if we don't have a breakdown is we always see is the average return. So what we'd like is to have as granular a measure of assets as possible. So if we are inside the firm and we're either management or we're analysts working for management, we would, uh, we would like to be able to break it down into these double units uh, and look at unit A separately from unit B. If we're outside the firm, all we can do is look at the operations as a whole. But again, that's better than including all of the non-operating assets and having our picture distorted.